Amen. Well, good morning, church family. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Would you stand as we sing together in honor of our country, the God-given country that he's given us, America the Beautiful. Here we go.
Amen. Amen. What a great way to start the worship service. Good morning, First Baptist and Menden. It's good to have you here today. We're glad that you came on this July the 4th weekend. I know it's Tuesday, but this is kind of the weekend we're celebrating. And 247 years of uh, this nation being founded. That is, uh, that's an incredible. We're blessed, and we're going to talk about that more as we go through the service today. Now, Rose warned me that Todd Dubos, I mean, Rose told me that Todd Dubos was here this morning. Where is Todd? Oh, I see him in the middle over there. Well, Todd, oh, and my pastor, Brother Wayne, and the two ladies that hold it all together right there <laughs> are Alicia and Miss Linda. It is good to have you all today. God bless you for being here. Yes. Those are some folks that have poured their heart and soul into this place for a lot of years. You know that. You love them. And there are probably other guests as well, and we're glad to have you this morning. Now, look, every time we get together, this is what we say, we have come here to brag on Jesus. And it's really not about what the preacher says. It's not about the singers. It's not even about you. It is all about him. That's what we've come to do today. That's what we've come to make this about. And I hope you'll join us in doing that as we go through the service today. I want to give you a chance to greet one another. So our visitors and are going to remain seated and all our members and regular attenders, let's stand in honor of our guests. You find someone this morning and make them feel welcome.
Amen. We get to celebrate that day, don't we, one of these days. That's where our hope is, church. Let's think about the same God yesterday, today, and forever. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your
Praise God for his faithfulness. Amen, church. You know, it makes me think of, especially at, on Independence Day when we celebrate our nation, it makes me think of the prophet Jeremiah as he was looking over the city of Jerusalem and just lamenting, where has God gone? Why were they delivered to such captivity and punishment? But you know, I love how, I absolutely love how Jeremiah, he writes this. And it reveals the true nature of God. No matter what's going on around in our world today, dear Christian, we are just sojourners passing through this land. And we love this land. It's my land, it's your land. But church, we have a higher calling. Jeremiah says this, I love this translation, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. You get an amen out there? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And his mercies never come to an end. Never come to an end. In fact, they are new every morning. Praise God for that, amen. Great is your faithfulness, he exclaims. I wonder if you're here today. I don't know how you came into this place. You may be just, God's grace is abounding in your life. And you may be struggling to, to find any type of mercy from our Lord. I want to encourage you, it's here. He's here. He's faithful. He's merciful. As we sing this hymn, Great is thy faithfulness. Think about that. Thank God for this country that he's given us. No matter how the times get, remember this, church. His steadfast love never ceases. And his mercies never come to an end. He is the faithful one. Sing with us. Great is thy faithfulness, O
Let's sing it, church. You are great and great. Don't you be seated. Thank you so much, Brother Scotty and all of our musicians. You know, that song, we've had two funerals this week here at this church, Pam Hillage and Sandra Sparkman. And I think about, as I thought about that song we just sang, I think about how that was their testimony. God was faithful to them until the very last breath they drew. And today, they are part of that great cloud of witnesses that would say to us, hey, God is faithful. They would say that to us today, and they would, from heaven itself. In a moment, we're about to open up the Word of God. It is living. It is relevant for today. It never returns void. This is not just another Sunday. This is a moment where we're going to open up the eternal, alive Word of God and look at what God has to say. And I don't know, when, when we talk about our nation and talk about praying for America, I don't know how you pray for America, but I think God has some things to say to us about that. How do we pray for our nation? What do we ask for our nation? What is it we're really wanting? And so we're going to look into to the Word of God today. And I believe that you're not here by an accident. I think God has you here for a reason. That means there's something that's going to happen in this worship service that's just for you. And I hope you're listening for it. I hope you're, you're, you're going to be listening for whatever God says to you this morning. And then I hope you will have the courage of your conviction to do something about it. And so I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for me. I'm going to pray for us as we open this timeless, eternal Word of God. It is the truth. And when the world is gone and billions of years after this world's gone, this Bible we're about to open will still be the truth. It'll still be the truth. So I'm going to ask you if you would, if you can and if you will, would you kneel with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we are so thankful today that we don't just come here as an exercise to do things that we always do. It's not routine. Every time we open your Bible, Lord, it's never routine. It's always a special moment. And I pray we would recognize this moment for what it is. That you, the eternal living God, the creator of everything, has something to say to each one of us. You know us. You have the hairs on our head numbers. You, you, you're intimately aware of who we are and where our needs are. So, Lord, speak to us today. And, Lord, give us the courage to do something about whatever it is you share. We don't want to be just hearers of the word. We want to be doers. So we pray for that today. We ask, Lord, that everything we've done so far and everything we do from this point on will honor your name, will glorify your name, will be to brag on you. 
you are all we have to offer this dying world. And you're all that they need. So, Lord, use this time in a special way. Thank you for your presence already so far today. And it is our great prayer, Lord, that we on this day can be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank y'all so much. Amen. 
You know, I never was a big fan of the sitcom Seinfeld, but I had seen a couple of episodes. It just seemed like to me it kind of it kind of uh, adopted the, the spirit of, of our age, then that is that there's really no purpose to anything. And, I, and so I never really got into it much, but there was an episode I did see uh, about Elaine, and she's talking to her boyfriend, and she, she asked him this question. She said, do you believe in God? And her boyfriend looks at her and said, yes. And she said, well, is it a problem? Then I'm not religious. And he said, well, not for me. And she says, well, how's that? And he said, well, I'm not the one going to hell. Now, you know, I got to tell you something. The the famous playwright George Bernard Shaw once said this, the worst sin toward our fellow creatures is not to hate them, but to be indifferent to them. To be indifferent to them. And I have to ask myself, and I've, believe me, I have had to do some repenting this week, even as I've prepared this message. How indifferent have we become as, as churches today? How insensitive have we become to the lost of this world? Have we left our first love? Have we lost our love? I think those are very important questions for all of us. What is it that we get passionate about today in our churches? Are we indifferent today to a lost and dying world? You know, I heard about a guy that was saved in in a church uh, in the South, This was some years ago. He was a young adult when he got saved, and he got fired up about Jesus. He got saved, and God got all of him. He got all of God. God got all of him. He couldn't keep quiet about it. He told his people at work. He told his friends, his his family, his neighbors. He told everybody. He was all excited about Jesus, fired up about him. You know what I'm talking about. And he went to church one Sunday night, and they sang the song, Rescue the Perishing care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave, weep o'er the erring one, bring them to Jesus, tell the poor sinner that Jesus can save. Well, he heard that song and that really fired him up even more. And when the service was over, he went up to his pastor and he said, pastor, I'm ready. And the pastor said, well, what are you ready for? He goes, I'm ready to go rescue the perishing. Let's do it. And the pastor looked at him and said, well, that's not something we really do. That's just a song we sing. When does it get to that point, see, for us, that that's not something we really do? That's just a song that we sing. It wounded his spirit for a lot of years, this man, until he, but he finally began to understand that that isn't what we're all about as a Christian. A Christian life is being passionate about rescuing the perishing. It is a continual burden that we bear. It's one that we bear every day, and it's not the preacher's job to rescue the perishing. It is our job as the people of God to rescue the perishing. Statistically even, if you want scientific statistics, they prove that letting the preacher be the only one doing the work of evangelism is the least effective way to bring people to Jesus. You know, the, the American Institute for Church Growth, they asked 10,000 people, and here's what they asked them. They asked them about their journey to come to Jesus. How did they get to church? How did they come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? 2% of them said, well, there was a special need in my life, and God kind of got my attention through that special need. 3% said, well, we just happened to want to go to church one Sunday. We walked in, and the preacher's message spoke to us, and we got saved. Six percent said the pastor's preaching and teaching and and a relationship with the pastor, and I was saved. One percent said visitation. The church came to my home. Five percent said, well, I was saved because I went to Sunday school and I heard the gospel and I was saved there. Five percent said there was an evangelistic crusade and I was saved through that. Three percent said the church had a special program and so I got involved and that's how I was saved. But 79 percent said a friend or a relative shared Jesus with me. You see, that's what it's really all about. People respond to people, not programs. It's not about a program and, oh, we got all kinds of programs as Southern Baptists. We got them in all of our churches, but people don't respond to programs. People respond to people. It's one-on-one. It's you and I going out and caring enough about someone else's soul that we are willing to get involved in their life. And it's time-consuming, and it's messy. It's not always easy. Last Sunday morning, we saw a lady baptized right up here. And she didn't go to church 
her whole life. She didn't know about Jesus, much about him, but she got saved right here through the kindness and love of this church. And as, as we reached out to her and her family, as we began to try to minister to them, you know what she said to us? She says, We've, I've never had anybody care about me like this church has cared about. You see, church, you didn't even realize this, but by reaching out to that young family, you have made an incredible difference in their life. And so she came last Sunday to be baptized and identify with Jesus and say, hey, I have been saved. I belong to Jesus. People respond to people, not to programs. God wants people to reach out in his name. This, now, this nation was founded on God's word. Now, that's just a historical fact. Whether you like it or not, doesn't matter. I don't care what your history teacher told you. You read the monuments in Washington, you won't find any of them that don't have a Bible verse on them. You read the founding documents, you will see God referred to throughout the founding documents. This nation was founded on the word of God. That's a historical fact. And America has become a a missionary sending nation, sending missionaries to nations all over the world. We used to be the nation that had a passion for the lost and it drove our politics and our economy and our schools and our homes. But today we are becoming a missionary destination, receiving missionaries from all over the world. Today we're becoming a confused people, rejecting not only God, but our own science and reason as well. Today, we're not only a people who say we don't want God to, we want God to leave us alone. We we want to do our thing without God, but we literally stand up against God boldly, arrogantly in his face. In some of our marches and in some of the things that happen in our world today. How do we as believers, how do we as Christians respond to the insanity and the blindness that we see going on around us? Should we get angry about it? Because I'll be honest. That is what I've done many times. I can't even watch the news anymore. I just get mad about everything. But that's not really the answer, is it? Paul shows us what attitude we ought to have. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 this morning. Now, I will tell you that Paul has spent the first eight chapters of Romans telling us that we are sinners, we're lost, it brings death with it. There is no hope from that except Jesus, but through Jesus and a cross and an empty tomb, you and I can be forgiven. And even more than that, not only does he take our sin away, but he gives us his righteousness in return. And even better than that, my old record of breaking the Ten Commandments is wiped away and Jesus' record of never breaking any of them is given to me. Wow. Paul spent the first eight chapters of Roman talking about that. And in chapter eight, it's my favorite chapter in all the Bible. He's been telling us about, hey, you can be certain you are justified already. You may not, God may not be finished with you, but it doesn't matter. It's Jesus that had the final word. He's the one that cried out, it is finished. And it is finished, sin and death in your life if you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior. That's what the Bible says. That's the truth of God's word. So yes. The first eight chapters, Paul's been saying, you can't lose that. There's no, God, you didn't get it yourself. God gave it to you and only God can take it away. And he said, it's not going to happen. So that's yours. It's solid. It's forever. That's what Paul said. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And he spent all eight chapters saying that. And then he's been on that incredible mountaintop. And then look what he says in chapter nine of Romans in verse one. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Paul sums it up. He says a mouthful right there. I don't even hardly have time in this short message to scratch the surface, but I hope that I can whet your appetite a little bit that you might want to scratch the surface on that. (coughs) Paul has been at the mountaintop. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And then all of a sudden, he turns right around and he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief 
What's that all about? I think Paul's going to give us a great attitude of how should we pray for our nation and what should we do when it comes to America, this nation that we love, and Americans. And the, th- verse, the first thing that sticks out to me, and, and a, lot, a lot is based on this, is that Paul says we must love people more than a way of life. We must love people more than a way of life. He said, I wish I were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. He goes from nothing can separate us to I have great sorrow and unceasing grief. And after he finishes discussing this incredible blessing of God's grace in our lives, he realizes that his people, the Israelites, have not received that blessing. Matter of fact, they're the ones that rejected Jesus. He even comes to the place where he wants this so much for them that he is willing, and I can't even imagine this, to go to hell himself if they would be saved. That's an incredible statement. I've read that statement so many times, and I'll be honest with you, I don't think, I don't know that I'm there. I, I've thought about it all this week. How do you get there? What, what kind of passion must you have to, to look at the people, your people, and say, I love them so much, and I love God's glory and honor so much that I'm willing to go to hell myself if they would be saved? How do you say something like that? And yet Paul says that because he has this great love for his people. But you cannot miss what he's not talking about here. He's not talking about a way of life. He's not saying, Lord, I want you to bring back the glory days of Israel. He's not saying all that. He's saying, I'm, I, I would literally be a curse separated from Christ for my people, not for our way of life. Listen, so many times when we pray for America, what are we praying for? I hear us, oh Lord, we, we love the freedoms. We love the prosperity. Give it back to us what we used to have. Listen, God doesn't want us praying for us to someday be able to have all the things we used to have. It's not about my childhood growing up. It is about the lost people who are going to hell today. That's what it's about. And when I make it about a way of life, when I'm praying for America, am I praying for the lost to be saved and how God might use me in that process? Or am I praying, God, bring back the old days? You see, that's not what Paul prayed. He didn't say bring back the old days. He prayed for people. His heart was broken for people because that's what it's all about. It was people. Paul saw that. God let him see that. That was such an important part of of everything that that his life was all about. He had a burning desire for God to be glorified and for the the blessings of freedom and prosperity. He, had, he didn't worry about those things for the Israelites. What he wanted was their salvation and the glory of God. That's what he wanted. And I think it's so amazing to us that Paul could say that. And I think one of the reasons why, let's just be gut honest today, is that we're too selfish to consider it ourselves. Isn't that right? It's just too much about us for us to really consider that ourselves. We cannot imagine giving up our own safety and security, our own inheritance, our own peace of mind, our own peace of God for a lost world that hates Jesus and hates us. And we can't even imagine that, really. I don't want you to get me wrong this morning. I have loved growing up in this nation. I have been blessed growing up in this nation. It is, we have been privileged. I, we talk a lot and the news people talk and, you know, the talking heads and they all talk about the privileged in America. Can I just say this to you? If you were born in this country and you're an American citizen, you are privileged. You are privileged. I don't care who you are. I don't care how rich or poor you are. Doesn't matter. You're privileged. You go other places in the world, you will know just how privileged you are. We have been blessed. And I'm thankful for every one of those blessings. The opportunities we have that our young people have in this country far exceed anywhere else in all of the world. But when we pray for this nation, if we're going to pray like Paul did, we can't be praying for the blessings and the prosperity. We need to be praying for the people. We need to be praying for the lost. What about them? There are... In the world today, most of the people that live out there, maybe it's 90% of the people in the world today, have never had the way of life that we've had. And yet there are literally millions of Christians out there who are faithfully let God shine through their lives no matter what way of life that they're being surrounded by. So our burden shouldn't be for what we have lost, but it ought to be for the lost, shouldn't it? 
That's what we ought to be burdened for. Those who stand to lose a lot more than just their freedoms and some prosperity, they stand to lose eternally, forever. They'll be in hell, separated from Christ. That's the greatest loss of all. Paul isn't the first one, by the way, to make this incredible statement, and I still don't even, I can't even almost grasp the statement, but he wasn't the first one to make it. Moses said the same thing. He was interceding. He came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. The people were, had made a golden calf for themselves, and they were very erotically and immorally dancing around that calf, and I mean, it was just not right. It was certainly didn't represent God. And, and so Moses throws down the Ten Commandments, and God is angry. God says, hey, I'll just wipe them out and start over. And Moses comes to God, and look what he says in Exodus 32. He said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a God of gold for themselves. But now, listen to this, if you will forgive their sins, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. Wow. Wow. The man of God interceding for people that he loves. He said, Lord, if you will, forgive their sin. And if you won't forgive it, blot me out with them. Blot me out of your book as well. That's what I'm calling intercession. That's an incredible love. But let me tell you something. The greatest example of this, by far the greatest example of this, is found in Jesus. You see, what Paul and Moses only talked about, Jesus did. Paul said, I would, I would be accursed for my people. Moses said, if you're not going to forgive them, blot me out. But none of that happens. But here's what Jesus did. According to Paul in Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the spirit through faith. You see, what Paul and what Moses only talked about doing, Jesus literally did. He didn't say, if you're not going to forgive them, blot me out. He said, you put the curse on me in their behalf. That's exactly what happened. On that cross, the curse that belongs to me, the death that belongs to me, the sins that I've committed that I deserve hell for, Jesus took all of that on a cross. Until he cried, it is finished. And an empty tomb sealed the deal. And so today, we can be saved and free and justified and all the privileges I mentioned to you a while ago. And why can we do it? Because Jesus went that, that extra mile. He didn't talk about it. He did it. He did it. What they said, make me a curse for them. Jesus became a curse for you and I. Oh, and... That's what real love looks like, doesn't it? And we can get mad all we want at this world, but what our lost world needs is the love of Jesus. Listen, judgment will come. That is absolutely certain. But today is a day of grace. And I know we look at the lost world out there and somehow we expect them to act like they're saved and they don't and we get mad about that, but we shouldn't. It's not, me, it's not up to me today to make judgments about them. It is up to me to tell them the truth about their sin, the truth that there is real salvation in Jesus. That's what's important to me. I don't need to spare their feelings. I need to just share the real truth with them. Today's a day of grace, and they need to know that. You know, Ray Stedman once asked a congregation why they had fired their pastor, and they said, well, he kept telling us we were all going to hell. And they got a new pastor, and so Ray asked and said, well, what does your new pastor say? And they said, well, he tells us we're going to hell too. And so he looked at him. He said, so what's the difference? And they said this. They said, the difference is that when the previous pastor said it, it sounded like he was glad. When the new pastor says it, it sounds like it breaks his heart. When we go out into a lost world out there where people are confused and messed up and dying and they, they don't know what anything stands for, they don't know what the purpose of anything in life is, they don't even know who they are anymore. When we go out there and we share the good news of the gospel and we talk to them about the fact that hell is real and they will spend an eternity there, do we say it like we're glad? Or do we say it like it breaks our heart? because that's what they need. They need to see the the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus. No, I'm not saying that we don't tell them the truth. (laughs) 
Because you have to tell them the truth. I've told you this so many times. The good news isn't good news until you tell them the bad news first, right? We got to tell them the bad news, but we ought to say it in love. Not in judgment, but in love. That's what it's really all about. That's what we are all about. William Temple was an Anglican priest. He, he founded this society of Christians and Jews. He said this one time, he said, the church is the only cooperative society in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. It's the way it's supposed to be. It's the way it should be. See, we're, yes, we take care of one another, but we're here for a different purpose and a mission. God has called us to go to the streets with the message. He's called us to go to a lost and dying world. So what do we get passionate about? I pray that we'll be passionate, more passionate about our fellow citizens going to hell forever than our former way of life. We may never get our former way of life back. But I'm going to tell you something. People that, that are saved in this life will spend an eternity with them, with Jesus. Leonard Ravenhill was a Bible teacher, lived over in Lindale, Texas, not very far from here. He was, you know, he was affiliated with uh, Keith Green and Last Days Ministries and tremendous Bible teacher. People would come from all over the world to go to his Bible studies. He had a Bible study every Friday night over in Lindale, Texas. And he, he uh, once wrote an article for Billy Graham's magazine, Decision. And I want to read to you what he said. This was in the 1970s. The title of the article was, Who Weeps Anymore? Here's what he said. The problem with Christians in America is we're not concerned over lost people. We're not concerned enough to cry. He said, a man and a woman will weep when their little pet gets run over in the street in front of their house, but that same couple has never wept one tear because their neighbor across the street is lost without Jesus. Something is wrong. He says, a woman will cry when her daughter walks down the aisle of a church to be married, but that same mother has never shed one tear because that same daughter has never been saved. Something's wrong. Listen, it is great sorrow. It is unceasing anguish. We wept over, he wept over lost people. That's what Paul did. How do we know that? Because in Acts chapter 20, when he was talking to the Ephesian elders, he said, I did not cease for three days and nights to warn people with tears. Paul wept over their lostness. He got it. And it wasn't about him. It was about their lostness and how God could use him. Paul was always concerned about that. Are we so concerned about our fellow American citizens that we weep over their lostness? When was the last time you shed a tear at all over the fact that somebody's going to go to hell today? They're going to die and leave this world and bust hell wide open. Or have we just come to the place where we somehow mistakenly believe that God's just going to call it even and everybody's going to go to heaven? Because that's not true. Hell is real and people are going to go there and people are going there. And while I'm preaching this sermon, somebody in this United States is going to die during this message and they're going to bust hell wide open. They'll never have another chance. Paul said, I'm not concerned about the way of life. When I pray for Israel, I'm concerned about people. And you and I, when we pray for America, yes, I, I thank God for the privileges that we've enjoyed. And I would love it if we continue to enjoy them for many decades to come. But when I pray for America, that's not what I need to pray for. I need to pray for lost people, American citizens, people I'm with every single day and around every single day. And they may, they, they're lost. They're going to hell. They don't even realize how fast they're, they're getting there. They're one heartbeat away. Two ladies I buried this week. Neither one of them were sick for a long time. Those were, they went suddenly. Their families didn't have time to prepare for that. It can happen to any of us at any time. God doesn't owe us a, a minute of life. And so I'm saying, when we pray for America, how do we pray? Paul says, I don't pray for a way of life. I pray for people. And then he tells us that we've got to love our fellow citizens even though they reject the God who blessed them. Look what he says there in verse 4 and 5. To whom belong, he's talking about the Israelites, to whom belong the adoption as sons. They were God's chosen people. And the glory and the covenants, they saw the glory of God come down on that mountain. They saw it in Moses' face. They had seen and experienced the glory of God and the covenants that he gave them, the giving of the law, the temple service. They saw the blood drained and sprinkled on the altar. And they realized that someday there would be the Lamb of God who would come and his blood would be the final payment 
would pay for all of our sins, and that was Jesus. They saw all of that. They saw the promises that were made to the patriarchs, the fathers, is what he says. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob saw those promises, heard them, and God fulfilled them, and he kept his word. And Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came according to the flesh. God in the flesh, who is God. He's over all. He's God. That's what he says. Blessed forevermore. Amen. So Paul says, yes, we've got to reach out to these people even though they're the ones who reject the God who who bless them. He goes, Israel had all those blessings of God as his chosen people. They had seen all those things, experienced all those things. They had seen God part the Red Sea. They'd seen God part the Jordan River. They'd seen God deliver into their hands armies that were larger than theirs. Give them the promised land that he promised them. Take care of them for 40 years in the wilderness. All of those things they saw. Paul said they saw all those things. And yet he was still willing to say, I'm willing to be accursed so that they might be saved. They were given the honor of being a blessing to the whole world, the Israelites were, of sharing the good news that God had overcome our stubborn, sinful rebellion through Jesus on a cross. You see, their whole story as God's chosen people is about God. Can I tell you, as Americans, our whole story is about God. God established this nation. But even more than that, Jesus saves individuals in this nation. and That's what it's all about. You see, nations will not exist forever. They're going to come and go, and one day this world will be gone, and all the nations will be forgotten about, but people will live on forever, either in heaven, with God, or in hell, separated from him. That's why it's all about people. It's not all about nations. God in Jesus rescued us from our sin and our selfishness, and we became his people. So the real sin for the Israelites is that they rejected the plan and the purpose of God for them. The real danger for us is that we don't reject God's plan and his purpose for us. We live in a nation that's rejecting the God who has blessed her. So what does that mean for us? How do we respond to that? No matter what happens in the future of our nation, we are here to share the good news that Jesus come, he's come to save sinners and to save us from ourselves. And we're the proof of that to this world that we live in. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 4, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We keep our eyes on Jesus, who is the only hope, not only of America, but of the whole world. Paul loved his people and he was zealous for them and for the glory of God. He wanted God to, he didn't want God to be disparaged. He didn't want people to look down on God and say, well, look, God couldn't save his own people. Why should I believe he can save mine? And so Paul is, he writes these things in Romans 9, 10, and 11 to kind of counter those wrong thinkings and wrong thoughts. He said, I myself would be accursed. (laughs) So here's the thing. God is not asking any of us to give up our salvation because that would be impossible. He's already said, you can't do it. It can't happen because God has declared it so. <clears throat> but he may be asking you to sacrifice something else. He might ask you to sacrifice your false pride. He might ask you to sacrifice your comfort zone. He might ask you to sacrifice a false sense of respectability when you think that, you know, if I, if I don't talk to others about Jesus, then they'll think I'm respectable. <laughs> You see, Christians are guilty of the sin of silence, the sin of omission, of apathy so many times. We let our culture intimidate us. Why? Because we think if we talk to somebody about Jesus, they're going to call us a religious fanatic or an extremist or a hater. And listen, we've been called all of those and we're going to be called them again. Can I just tell you something, church? We got to get over it. We got to get over that. There is no time for us to worry about what other people think about us. The day of judgment is drawing near. It is. A day when nothing can be taken back after that. A day when it's all set in stone. And we got to make up our minds. Are we going to be a friend of God like Abraham was? Are we going to be a friend of a dying world? Which one will it be? God's looking for a people who stand and say, I unashamedly am a friend of God. 
and share the good news that there is a way out, that there is a remedy for our sin, that we don't have to deny our sin and we don't have to try to rationalize away our sin. We can face our sin and place it on a cross and it's dealt with forever. We'll never meet it again. So what are you willing to sacrifice so that others can know Jesus? James D. Kennedy wrote a book called Led by the Carpenter. I want to read you just a little bit of that book, just a paragraph. He says, a man walked into a little mom and pop grocery store and asked them, do you sell salt? Ha, said the pop, the proprietor, do we sell salt? Look, and he showed him the customer, an entire wall of shelves stocked with nothing but salt, Morton salt, iodized salt, kosher salt, sea salt, rock salt, garlic salt, seasoning salt, Epsom salt, every kind of salt imaginable. Wow, said the customer. The guy looked at him that owned the store. He says, oh, you think that's something? That's nothing. Come look here. And he led him back to a back room of shelves filled with nothing but bins and cartons and barrels and boxes of salt. Do we sell salt, he said. Unbelievable, said the customer. You think that's something. Let me show you something else. I'll show you salt. And he led him down some steps into this big basement, five times as large as the previous room, filled wall, floor to ceiling with every imaginable form and size and shape of salt, even those huge Salt licks for the cow pasture. Incredible, said the customer. You really do sell salt. No, said the guy that owned the store. That's just the problem. We never sell salt. But that salt salesman, who boy, does he sell salt. (laughs) And then Kennedy ends the story. And here's what he says, church. Salt that stays on the shelf doesn't do any good at all. It's true, isn't it? Salt that stays on the shelf doesn't do any good at all. <clears throat> There's an evangelist named Eddie Martin. We had him at Summer Grove one time. I remember when he came some years ago. You might have heard of him. He was known as very blunt and straightforward kind of guy. And he tells the story about one of the big revivals he went to, and they, they let him stay in the home of this very wealthy family. They, I mean, they had a maid service and everything. It was, it was a big deal. And he said one night he was eating supper and the lady of the house was in there and and he just asked her something about, uh, he said to her, I'll see you tonight at the service. And she goes, oh, I'm not going to the services tonight. He goes, why not? Is there something wrong? And she said, well, we have a mission study group in our church and I'm a part of it. And tonight we're meeting to talk about missions. Well, Eddie Martin didn't like that too much. And of course, he didn't hold his tongue a lot. And he said, well, you know, I would have thought that when you have a revival meeting at church, you'd cancel all those things and everybody would support the revival. Well, she didn't really like what he said, and so she kind of got in his face a little bit, bowed up to him, and said, well, I'll have you know, sir, that missions is every bit as important as evangelism. And he was not going to argue with that, but he came back at her, and he said, well, you go ahead and you go to your mission meeting because you really don't care about lost people anyway. And she looked at him, and and the air got pretty thick about that time, and she said, how dare you say that? What makes you say that? And he said, well, I'll tell you, yesterday I talked to your maid. And I asked her if she was saved, and she said no. And I shared the gospel with her, and she accepted Jesus yesterday as her Savior. And I asked her, how long have you been working here? She said, three years. And I asked her, has has the lady of the house ever told you about Jesus? And she said no. So Eddie Martin said, you go along with your mission meeting, but you'll never convince me that you care about lost people. So she stomped out of the room, and that night he went to his meeting, and he was preaching about halfway through the service. He said she came in and sat in the back. When the invitation came, she came down the aisle, and she was a broken lady, tears coming down her face. She went before her church, and she said, I have been a phony, and I need you to forgive me. I have loved church work. I have loved mission work, and I have loved this church, but I haven't loved lost people. Not the way Jesus loved lost people. I want you to forgive me, and I want God to forgive me. What are you willing to to sacrifice Some people thought he was a nut. I mean, he was just a shoemaker after all, and he wasn't even a really good one at that, just average. But every evening after he worked, he would go home and study Greek and Hebrew and a variety of modern languages. He went and he he read Captain Cook's voyages to kind of expand his horizons a little bit, which because of his poverty, he couldn't go anywhere. It kept him pretty much bound to a little English village. Some people said he would have spent, probably spent his time better getting a second job to support his growing family, but his passion, 
it was a passion. It wasn't just a hobby. There was something behind it. Early in life, he'd become concerned about the millions of unbelievers who lived outside of Europe. And he was trying to figure out a way that what could be done to bring the gospel to those people who had never heard it. And, of course, God used him to figure that out. He ended up going to India to serve as the first Protestant missionary in the modern era. Hudson Taylor and David Livingstone would follow him also and take up his cause of missions. But because of one impoverished shoemaker named William Carey, he followed his God-given passion. Large parts of the world that had little or no access to the gospel have populations today of people who confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. What are you willing to sacrifice? Paul said, I love God so much and I love these people so much. I'm willing to be separated from Christ if they could be saved. Would you bow with me? Church, it's an urgent call. I don't think I have to tell you this. Isn't it pretty evident that the end is growing near? (laughs) How much further do you think we can go? thumbing our nose in God's face before he steps right in the middle of all this mess and puts a stop to it. How much further can we go until the judgment of God comes? Oh, he came the first time to save, to seek and to save. And that's what we're in, that day of grace. But there's coming a day of judgment. And when Jesus comes back the next time, it's not going to be to seek and to save. It'll be to bring righteous judgment to a lost and sinful world. You and I, have been given the privilege to bring the good news of the gospel to this world. When we pray about America, let's don't pray, oh God, give us back our childhood. (laughs) Give us back all the good old days. Oh, those are nice things, but let's pray for the lost people in America. Lord, send me to them, whatever that cost whatever it means, whatever the sacrifice. In just a moment, if you're not a Christian, you never made Jesus Lord and Savior, I don't care how many times you've joined a church, been baptized, sprinkled, confirmed, it doesn't really matter. None of that. But you know in your heart, you've never had a real relationship. Jesus is not Lord and Savior of your life. I would invite you to come talk to one of our pastors. We're not here to make you into anything because we can't. That's God's business. But we certainly want to introduce you to Jesus. He is the lover of your soul. He's made a way for you. Why would you spend another moment lost in this world when you know you can have absolute certainty of salvation and an inheritance? And I'm going to invite you to come in just a moment. If you're here, you're not a member of the church, maybe you've been visiting for the last several weeks, and you say, well, I think this is where God wants me. Why don't you come? Commit yourself to a wonderful family of believers, people that will love you, support you, walk through life with you. No, we're not perfect, (laughs) especially the preacher. But we're on a journey with Jesus. You may need to come take one of these pastors by the hand or maybe get on your knees to this altar. You may want to say, hey, listen, I just want you to know I'm in it. I'm with you. We're going. We're going to do it. We are going to rescue the perishing. We're going to get out there because we're going to do it for Jesus. People are dying and they need him. Father, we are so thankful for your word. It is powerful and it never returns void. I pray, Lord, today that your word will bring conviction. Lord, that we'll be ready to do something about it. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand for me. Scotty's going to lead us in a word of invitation, hymn of invitation. I invite you to come right now as he sings. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see.
find strength for today. Taste the living water and never thirst again. So come just as you I hope and pray that you have a wonderful 4th of July. I know it's Tuesday. I hope you celebrate. Listen, sit down and tell your children and your grandchildren what it's really all about. They're not going to learn it in school. You sit down and you tell them what it's really all about. Let's pass that wonderful heritage God has given us down to our children and our grandchildren. You make sure they know what the 4th of July really is all about and what we're celebrating. It was good to see Todd and Brother Wayne and the whole family here today. Now, y'all are here because you're, you're meeting about an Israel trip, and Todd, do y'all have a few places left in that trip? You do. And you're meeting in, the, in room 217, the old library, at what time? Immediately following this service. Okay, good deal. Well, that'd be wonderful. If you are interested, they've got a couple of spots left. Todd, Thomas Worsham is going to go. I think Brother Wayne is going to go as well. And Brother Wayne, is this your fourth last trip or your fifth last trip? I'm, not sure. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Brother. I know that that's a little, that, uh, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, <laughs> I just had to. It is so good to see them here. And Gene Gibson, where is Gene and his sweet wife? Oh, way over there. Gene has been, he's been down in South Louisiana preaching, kind of helping a little old church. And he is home now. We got Gene and his wife back, and we're so glad to have them. And it's good to see you, brother. God bless you. You know, I love you. You are such a blessing. I get up every morning and still can't believe that my name is on that sign out there. But I'm thankful every single day that it is. Rose and I love you with all of our heart. Hope you have a great week. Sing us out, brother. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be.